There's a famous remark about comedy supposedly made by the actor Edmund Keane on his deathbed. Dying is easy, he said. Comedy is hard. Tonight, we're hoping to get at that notoriously elusive subject with the help of two of its foremost exponents, the writers Sam Bain and Jesse Armstrong. Together, they created Peep Show, the Channel 4 sitcom about a flat-sharing odd couple, Jeremy and Mark, which went on to become the cult comedy of its generation. It won critical applause and a raft of awards, including two BAFTAs. More recently, they created the comedy drama Fresh Meat, heading up a team which included a number of young, new writers. If anybody can teach comedy writing, they can. So, tonight's BAFTA masterclass is a chance for anyone interested in the genre, any budding comedy writers out there, to glean some of the trade secrets that have proved so successful for Sam and Jesse. Comedy is meant to be a gift. It's meant to be something you either have or you don't. Um, it's, in some sense, is not meant to be really teachable. And yet, at the same time, it, it is a craft, and clearly, you get more experienced at it, and you learn things about it. So I kind of wanted to start by asking you, what is the stuff that you learn? It's a difficult question to say how much you can learn about the art of writing comedy. All I know is that we often when we're writing together, um, come back to little bits of wisdom and advice that we've had over the years. And I think that's the most useful thing that we can offer to people here today is, is just try to um, tell you as many things that have been useful to us in our writing careers as we can think of, because I know that we often come back to just little things that we've heard over the years. I remember going to see Richard Curtis and him giving, he did like just 10 tips about how to write, um, you know, uh, and, and those are things that in the writing room when you're, you can't crack a plot or you can't think of a joke or you don't know what a character should do next, um, you want those pearls of wisdom which Sam is now going to tell you, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so before we find out what you can teach everybody here, what did Richard Curtis teach you? Well, one thing he, he, he mentioned which was very practical and simple was that if you've got a, a good bit of your script that's working, make it longer. I mean, he mentioned the uh, he mentioned the the scenes in Notting Hill where Hugh Grant's at these kind of interviews for the movie, and and it's just he's faking being a a journalist. And he's just a really funny. So he's made them he did five rather than three or whatever. And I thought that was a very simple and unpretentious tip, you know. The other one was just one about sort of volume. It was about kind of if you're looking for a good line, write ten, and if if the tenth is good and the, and the first nine are rubbish, it doesn't matter about the first nine. He was saying, I guess, you don't, doesn't matter if you fail nine times, if you succeed once, which is actually is quite a sort of, you know, quite a, quite a noble sentiment, I think. Um, I was going to ask uh, how you got your first writing jobs and um, how you broke into the industry, really. What, what was that process? We got an agent. That was the kind of the big... Break. Um, how did you get an agent? There's a bit missing there. Yes. <laughs> I had a friend at the BBC who suggested a couple of agents. We wrote to one, they didn't want us. We did. We, we, there was lunch. one agent who expressed a minimal amount of interest, uh, not really actually interested, but we managed to con her into saying she sort of was interested. And then we managed to make her meet us at one o'clock so we could tell our friends and acquaintances that we were having lunch with an agent. That was, that was a good tactic for a while. It only lasted about a week until she turned us down. But, but did we, did, we, did, we did, I mean, Sam had some contacts, but we just, we sent out our script to lots of people in the, you know, Writers and Artists Yearbook. And also, I think one thing that is a really good tip if you don't have an agent is to just look at the shows that you admire and um, target people involved with those shows and say, I love this show. And you know, I would like to do something similar, or this is the world that I think my stuff could exist in, because people respond to that rather than just, yeah, I've got your name and I'm sending this to you. We made two non-broadcast pilots of Peep Show that were both quarter of an hour long. And originally the show was much more based around TV clips. The original idea for the show was to have Michelin and Webb sort of talking over TV clips. So as you'll see, it's quite heavily um, based on that and yeah it's just kind of a, a sort of starting out we sort of tried a few things and and as you'll see it was a bit different to what we ended up with but a good learning experience 
Oh, not Nazis, Mark. I can't have Nazis with my breakfast. Would you prefer TV job shop? Their inventory you will need a job eventually. That would do me. You know, a desk job, but where you're allowed to wear a wetsuit every now and again. Mm, yeah, but Hasselhoff's top of the lifeguarding tree. Couldn't expect to get in at the top. Let's see what God's up to. I have to do this. Perfect place, perfect oh, place. a waterfall. Yes, yes that is nice. You know, this cartoon thing I've got going with Sophie at work. Yeah. Well, do you think it would be over the top if I did something in oils? What's your usual medium? Biro. Oh, I can watch this lovely fucker all day. Hey! I want to see what the weather's like. I will call ADT. Today. 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 Jesus, maybe we should call ADT. What do they do? I don't know. Something to do with sexual diseases? Had you started from the beginning with the point of view uh, cameras? I mean, was that absolutely integral to Peep Show from the very beginning? Yeah, yeah, very much. I mean, the, the clips was the starting off point. That was Andrew O'Connor's idea. And he kind of came to us with that and the idea of doing that with Mission of Webb, who we already knew really well and sort of really liked. And we, we came up with the POV camera work and the voiceovers, which obviously very much worked together as a marriage. And that kind of informed the tone of the show as well, because obviously it was very much day-to-day -day life, mundane, and it kind of helped us create a sort of very sort of realistic for a sitcom tone. Um, yeah, so it was always the idea of doing the voiceovers and the POV. What changed from the pilot to the first of the series itself? Looking at that, it, uh, the response is warm. I think there's probably another show to be made, which is, <laughs> which is uh, maybe everyone's being polite, but which is the, the clip show, which was, uh, you know, be, I think Beavis and Butterhead had been not that long around, and there was a, an idea that you could do a sort of two students, kind of stoners, taking the piss out of TV. We're not, I think there are writers who would write that stuff better if it was just jokes about stuff on TV, but I think we knew that we would do better if we could get it into more other, other areas as well, emotional areas. Uh, one of the things that was interesting about Peep Show as soon as it started was partly that voiceover thing because it, it creates a, a very specific kind of comedy which is a commentary comedy that you can split apart the visual and what's being said and get a kind of very large payoff. There's a great joke where um, Jeremy is determined to cook a meal decides to cook sea bass and walks towards the fridge saying, do we have sea bass? <laughs> you know, which, is, which is funny in itself, but then you can do the opening of the fridge and because you've got his point of view and you see this kind of yawningly, arctically empty fridge, uh, you get another laugh. That, that sort of joke is one I think that we wouldn't allow ourselves because, because it is funny and I remember it in the thing, but the truth is that Jeremy would know <laughs> wouldn't have sea bass. <laughs> So, you, and, and uh, it's these are, I think the, those are the sort of choices you have to make all the time as a comedy writer is, yeah. that's a funny, that's going to be funny, but is it going to undermine that character? Well, you might say, oh, it's Jeremy, not Mark. If it was Mark, he would never think that, yeah. but Jeremy might. Yeah, I think Jeremy is kind of just, Jeremy, yeah. just stupid enough to hope well, that there might be sea bass. This is exactly there. the sort of thing we talk about all day. It's like, <laughs> is he stupid enough? <laughs> is it funny enough to get away with a bit of you know, unrealistic plotting. Um, there's another kind of big problem with the first episode. You're having to teach your audience, as it were, the rules of your comedy, particularly if you're doing something new like this. One of the things we learned early on, which was a valuable lesson, was to sort of, I don't know who told us this, but sort of to start on episode three sort of thing for a sitcom. So if you imagine that you've got away with the sort of how they met episode, which is often people write that. And we did that in the first week we ever wrote. We wrote a how they met episode for another show. And it's sort of wrong because that's the only episode you'll ever do about that. It doesn't show what the show is like to anyone. So if you start with episode three, you imagine that you, the, the situation's already up and running. It's a good way to kind of just get in, get hit the ground running, and that's what we sort of try to do with that show. How do you go about creating distinctive characters? It's a really good question because I think if there's one, you know, the main thing with sitcom is character. It's all about the character especially that sitcom because you see them every week. And I think it's difficult, you know, I think with Peep Show, we vaguely had people in our lives that we sort of knew about. We also had a sort of archetypal, archetypal dynamic in mind, sort of extrovert meets introvert, you know, the kind of opposites attract. So sometimes you create characters in a relationship and it functions only in that way. With Fresh Meat, obviously you've got sort of archetypes again of sort of different kinds of students. So 
Although you can get into stereotypes, which is a problem, you can go into types, that's not necessarily a bad way in. Don't be scared to write an archetype, not a stereotype, but a, you know, a Homer Simpson, because you will write a crap failed dad be different to somebody else who's writing that same character. So it's not a bad place to go, oh, yeah, th that character seems obvious to me, but it's not necessarily obvious to everyone else, and also you will have a different voice for them, probably. I think a character is worldview, isn't it, the comedy? If you have a character, if you don't, what, how they view the world... Then you don't then, need to know all that. Then you've got, you don't need to write what they did when they were a teenager. you just got the voice, and that's all you need. Right. Shit. I need to sort this. I mean, what am I going to do? What's going to happen here? Because, personally, I have no idea. I really need to get to a urinal, Mark. Do you know what? I think I might actually toss a coin. I, I think tossing a coin might be the best available route open to me right now. You are joking. Why not? I don't seem to have any other ideas. OK, so uh, heads, I marry, lifetime of potential grinding resentment. Tails, I stay here, become a social outcast and turn my back on the woman I may very well love. I'm excited. I'm kind of excited too. So... Ah, uh, it's marry. I'm going to marry shit. Best of three? Yes, exactly. Best of three. Ah, uh, heads again. Shit. Best of five? No, the coin has spoken. Great. Let's get out of here. I am busting. No, I'm not getting married. You're overruling the coin. Well, the coin isn't actually the boss of me, Jeremy, and how I felt when it told me to marry makes me think I definitely shouldn't. So, uh, text everyone. Te text everyone to tell them that. A text? Yeah, te tell them... Te tell them I'm, I'm doing a Stephen Fry. We're in Brussels. I'm eating chips and mayonnaise. I'm on the edge. You, you found a blanket under the garage door and I'm wearing an overcoat and, and, and no one should approach me and, and I'll be back in a couple of weeks and everything's fine. Maybe we'll have a wedding in a couple of weeks, but I'm, I'm on the edge. Stress that. Everyone needs to be kind to me. Text that. You want me to send all that to everyone? I'll cover the cost. We'd worked a long time doing... Well, it seemed a long time to us at, uh, at that time writing for uh, children's shows, which is incredibly valuable, for sketch shows, for radio, and we did know that we really, this was, you know, people talk about novelists finding their voice, and this was one where we really liked David and Rob as performers. We knew that it was difficult to get a pilot, and we did a lot of work, because we knew that it was a really a, a promising opportunity to, to get something with our own tones of voice in there. Um, how much power did you have on that first series? Presumably you were fantastically grateful to get the series and, you know, not inclined to kind of negotiate hard, or maybe that's not true, I don't know. I think that's true to it. I mean, we've, obviously, over the years, you get more authority because, you know, you're worthy of it, more respect, and you've proven yourself. So, yeah, it's a bit different. But we certainly... One of the great, great advantages of that show is that we had Dave and Roll from the beginning, and casting is everything if you can get the t your leads that are right and there was never any debate about that we wrote the characters for them which gave us a massive advantage you know the nightmare would have been you write your script and then you have a cut act you want and someone's actually you know flavor of the month let's give it to you know this this um, soap star and he'll get the audience and then your show is destroyed which has happened to many writers and that would never an issue for us I mean, obviously there's a range of things that a, a, a kind of a writer could go to the wall for, which might be about direction, it might be about the kind of final edit. Mm. You'd go for casting. Absolutely, you know, because especially with the lead character, if you write a character and the casting isn't right, there's no chance. It, you know, luckily we've, we've had very few experiences like that, but it's, it can be the death now for the whole show. You've got no chance. So. I think it's the most important thing to try and have a voice and if there's one battle worth fighting. When you're writing like a scene, do you, when you begin it, do you know exactly where it's going to go or do you sometimes have that nice journey of finding out as you write? We're quite anoraks about plot. We kind of tend to plan it all in advance, don't we? Partly because we write together so you need to know what the other person is doing sometimes. I mean, to me, the fun of a, of a scene is knowing exactly where it is going to go and actually enjoying getting there and maybe going on some weird directions but you know you, the confidence to know you're going because that's the hard bit in a way I think knowing where you're going to end up yeah we rarely when we're writing together end up somewhere different to where we said we were going to get at the end of the scene we do, I don't we rarely sort of ring each other and go I just you know I'm sorry I've got Mark Mark's married to someone you're going to have to deal with it I'll send you through the document <laughs> oh thanks but, um, <laughs> I think it's true to say that our feeling is that if you get a dramatic situation, it will almost by definition, depending if you've built your characters right, also be a comic situation. 
if you're trying to work out a plot, it doesn't necessarily have to read that funny on the page it, as long as it reads dramatically, because if, then if your characters are, 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 are good characters, they will react in amusing ways. And, and, and um, I think that's, that's a tip. Not all our tips are going to be plagiarised from Richard Curtis. That's our first <laughs> demi-tip. When you say, when we're trying to work out a plot, is that the part of the process... When you're, when you're thinking of a series, is that the part of the process that comes first? Well, we, we do all the plotting for Peep Show together, so we sit in the room and we kind of work it all out and do a plan, and then we go off and write dialogue separately. That's how we've always done it. It's the hardest bit. It's a technical... It's almost like engineering. It's almost like, will this table stand up? Does it work? Does it function? And also, this is another demi tip. My added with the other tip, make a whole tip, <laughs> which is that I just think most writers, most people need uh, somebody to verbalise plot stuff to because, it, because, like Sam said, I think it is engineering and it's it's hard and it's complicated and you can get stuck in a groove and talking it through with either a writing collaborator, but anyone else, a helpful producer or, uh, or, or a friend, can help you get through idea A, B, and get to C, which is, might be the one you want. I want to ask a really strange question. It's got nothing to do with the technical tips. Uh, probably remember the Yeats poem, no dread, no hope, a tender dying animal, a man awaits his end, dreading and hoping all. Why don't animals laugh? What is, what is comedy? <laughs> um, is it because we're afraid of death and we want to be able to laugh at it? Or because we're afraid of our situation in life and want to be able to laugh at, laugh at it? Or what, what function does it serve? <laughs> Sam, you, I've noticed yeah. that you had some Bergson on your I, desk yes. recently, yeah? <laughs> the philosophy of comedy. <laughs> yeah. So Why do we laugh? <laughs> I'm a master. <laughs> now. Yeah. Well, you have to answer these questions. <laughs> If you want my honest answer, I think, I think it's, a, it's a relief of tension, you know. So, like, I think when people watch, hopefully watch Peep Show and they identify with these, you know, terrible thoughts, it's sort of like the laugh of thinking, I'm not just the only one who's bonkers and has terrible thoughts and that relief of tension and you make a connection that, that goes sort of outside yourself. And I think with Four Lions, that definitely is the case, you know, the tension. And Chris Morris does this a lot with the paedophilia especially did, and the tension around those issues can be care carefully transformed by someone like him, who's a master, into sort of the release of all that tension by laughing about it. We're going to strike target confirmation. It's our ostrich and grizzly bear. Ostrich and grizzly bear, the target. The bear is down. Repeat, the bear is down. They've got the bear. I think that's a Wookiee. That's a Wookiee. No, it's not. It's a bear. There's a Wookiee at bear control. The bear target has changed. It's now target Honey Monster. Is a Honey Monster a bear? A Honey Monster is not a bear. A Honey Monster is a bear. The Honey Monster is down. It was a target. It was a bear. The Honey Monster is down. Honey Monster is not down control. We have a Wookiee down. What's a Wookiee? A bear, it's a bear. No, it is a Wookiee. You've just shot it as a bear. It's a, Wookiee, a, it's bear. a bear. No, Wookiee, it's a bear. Wait, what? The Wookiee is down, the Wookiee is not the target. Yes, the well, it must be the target. I just shot it. <laughs> that bit is in there for, weirdly, although you, you see somebody shot in cold blood, where it's shot, it, it is comic relief at that moment, and you need it because the, the characters you've travelled with through the story up until that point are in a, in, a, in a dark, darkly comic, but dark place, and I think that beat is a necessary relief for the audience. How do you know where you're going to need that comedy beat before the, you've edited it, which has already placed it in a, in a certain position? With, with that film, a lot of our early discussions with Chris were sort of working out whether we could make a film about this subject at all. You know, it was like, what would be, what would be funny about this? It was sort of like, it was quite exciting sort of sense of pioneering, which is what he always does, Chris, and we were very happy to help him on that journey. And, and you're dealing with the question of tone all the time. Like, it would it be funny, you know, someone being blown up is either not funny or very funny or tragic or pathetic, depending on how you do it. So it's all about execution. And as you say, you know, you learn, as Jesse pointed out, you know, this is, it gets too much, you need relief, and that's all kind of trial and error, really. 
Um, I was wondering, how many people uh, do you send your scripts to to sort of give you feedback once they're done? Yeah, we uh, ordinarily, I guess, when we finish a script, we'd send it to the producer, executive producer, director, and and eventually to uh, somebody at the channel. Yeah. yeah, that would be who we'd send it to as a matter of course, and then and then oh, and yeah, we we would expect notes from everybody. Um, when you um, know that you've finished your first draft, what's the most kind of helpful thing that comes after that? I think we all, we're big believers in read-throughs, you know, read-throughs as early as possible, sometimes sort of painfully early, when, when you sort of feel like it's too early, it's usually the right time. It's a very um, bracing experience usually, <laughs> seeing your stuff and you, and you have a, a hundred ideas really of things that you wish you could change and you, hopefully you can if you've got enough time. I've asked both of you actually whether you now have a sense, you know, because of the experience you've had and, and the length of experience you've had, uh, of whether you just know technically how a joke will work better than you did when you started. Yeah, I think I always, I'm always th coming up with uh, um, global decisions on what it is, and it's like, oh, it's surprise, it's, it's all surprise, isn't it? That's what makes you laugh at a joke. It's exactly the opposite of surprise in a lot of cases, isn't it? Because a character does exactly what you think you, see, you would do, and it's very, very that's funny. That's not a tip, man. He's just contradicted <laughs> you. <laughs> Any tips? The other one is the sociological, you know, the one that, that, that it's really things we hate, and we're baring our teeth. Ha, 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 go away. That's yeah. another one that I think is quite oh, <laughs> possible, but I don't think it's true all the time. Well, if it's not true, then don't say it. Well, it's... <laughs> We have, well, on Peep Show, Ian Morris and Robert Popper, who are both writers in their own right, help us script edit, and often they would just say, you should end on that word, and then you can have an argument about whether they're right or not. But the argument is really just, I don't agree, or saying it again back at them. There's, it's very difficult <laughs> to describe why yeah. you need to land on a particular word. Um, it's a bit like music. Like Sometimes we have debates or arguments, fights about tracks on certain shows and and it's very hard to convince someone that the piece of music they don't like they should like like what do you say well you should like it because it's it's in b minor or i mean it's just, you can't explain it you just go well it's great no it's not yes it is and it, it's, a, it's usually building the logic back isn't it if you try to convince someone that a joke is good you can, t can, can create a wonderful um theoretical basis but it doesn't make it any funnier to them when <laughs> yeah, you retell no, it if they don't um, so it's always um back back engineered that kind of thing. You mentioned it a little bit in talking about Peep Show, the importance of having drama, which then necessitates the fact that you actually care about I mean, that's it, that clip, the wedding clip, Sophie is in a, the most appalling place there. And, you, and it, uh, as I remember it, you do care about how she feels, and that kind of curiously feeds into the comedy rather than pulling away from it. Well, I mean, I strongly believe that you don't, if you don't care, then you fa you failed. It doesn't have to be deeply care like you know in a in a tragic drama but you need to be on the, on the side of the characters wanting them to succeed on some level otherwise you have no interest the main things that bother me in watching a show is either I don't care or I don't believe what's happening that's cr critical if you don't if you think this, this would never happen this is ridiculous then you lose interest well, you set Comedy your own boundaries, and our boundaries are t have tended to be relatively realistic things. But you know, uh, Graham Linehan creates a different kind of world, yeah. and then, but everything that happens within that world is truthful for that world. And yet, you can push it quite far because Fresh Meat does. You know, Fresh Meat is is both comedy drama, and yet things happen that mm. are sort of just on the edge. I mean, I know it was any power showers, and it was all dorm rules, but if you think about it, it was a bit fucking gay. Yeah, don't. Um, you know, there's oh, no don't need be to. a homo. Well, JP, uh, <laughs> the thing is, mate, um, I am a homo. Da Gaylord! <laughs> Seriously, man. Don't bend me, queeroid. I, I am. I'm, I'm gay. Stop saying it. You'll turn gay. Well, I am gay. Yeah. Well, I'm gay too. Yeah. I'm glad to be gay. What a gay day. Yeah. Um, I'm actually gay though. Dude, this one is getting kind of old now. Yeah, I'm gay, JP. I like men. What? If we wrote a episode of Peep Show with um, 
uh, as few jokes in as a scene like that, it would die because you set your sort of metabolic rate for how many jokes the audience expect and what you're comfortable with. Do you have to kind of hold yourself back if you're coming off a different kind of writing? I mean, or is it, is it a, a relatively easy process, that? Well, I think, yeah, every show is different. And as Jesse said, you set the tone. And, and that, that was always a worry for us, you know, with that show. It was like, is it going to be formed in two stools? Because comedy drama, which is what it is, is a dangerous genre because it's um, sometimes too not funny enough and sometimes not dramatic enough. And you don't quite know sometimes the parameters. So we had to sort of make sure that we... And I guess we sort of used our experience of Peep Show and thought, well, actually, let's just go emotional and sometimes not go for the joke. You're in the position now on Fresh Meat where you are kind of running uh, the show as well yeah. and, and briefing other writers. So mm. what's that process like? The process is good. It's, we do two weeks where we, everyone talks about anything, university experiences, stuff from life, things that could make plots, um, what they think about the characters, things that could happen, and you get a big munge of stuff, and, and then that gets shaped into the rough storyline of the series and then talk with individual writers about how their episodes are going to work. And do you remember things from being briefed yourself as writers uh, that make you think, actually, you know, this is a terrible way to brief a writer, and this is, a, this is yeah. what I need? Well, mainly you shouldn't slag someone off for being <laughs> crap, or tell them their idea's bad, or laugh in their face. I mean, I think you have to have a very um, open environment, because ultimately it's quite exposing. If you're sitting around with six, seven people, and you go, I've got a funny idea, you want to make sure that you're not going to be smashed in the face if it's not funny. <laughs> okay, well, let's look at uh, the next clip, which is uh, Sam, you're going to introduce yeah, so this from is Bad Sugar. Talking of, sort of different shows we've done, this is sort of a new departure for us. It was just on in August, a pilot, which we've got, luckily got a series for next year, and it's sort of started out as a sort of idea of a pastiche of soaps, but it became hopefully its own thing. You've got a trickier kind of issue of tone there because you've, you're kind of balancing on the edge of deliberately writing a scene which is supposed to be slightly corny, but mm. that you know it and that the audience knows it and that they know what the illusions are. Um, is that a kind of process that you're doing when you're at the script stage? The tone of your show is that other ineffable thing when, when, when you've sort of written the first page, it might not be clear to you, but by the end of the script, you need to have a grip on what the tone of your show is. Anything you can do to help give your sense of what your tone will be, whether it's having pictures of the cast that you would love to be in it, or whether it's uh, knowing what film or other TV show it will be a bit like, is incredibly useful because otherwise you can find yourself sort of not knowing what sort of jokes you should be allowed in your show. I think the whole point is you try and figure out the rules first so that you can write with confidence. And I think we were very worried about pastiche because the worst thing you can do is sort of make a show where you think, well, none of this is real. It's all just TV about TV, and so I don't care. And I think, like I said earlier, I think you do have to care on some level for the kind of comedy we write, not for everyone. So we wanted to sort of have a balancing act of silliness, but also these people are real, you know. I'm so sorry about earlier. I, I wasn't very friendly. I suppose I'm just jealous because you're, you're so beautiful. Oh. No, you're joking. You're the beautiful one. Oh, no. You're lovely. I'm just an old sack. Oh, no, I'm an old sack. You're too perfect. Your hair, it's like there's a wonderful machine inside your head pumping out luxuriant, glossy hairs. Mine, it's like sticks. Do sit. Let me brush yours. For me, uh, as a fan, the mo one of the most important things about the sitcoms I love is at the point in which they decide to stop. Um, is it something that you ever think about, something in the back of your mind, um, whether it's something that you have to you know, tackle with or something that you're tempted into, um, whether it's you know, a genuine dilemma, you know, should I stop or you know, has it got legs to keep going? I think we get the hint. <laughs> <laughs> it is a dilemma, I think. You, do, well, you don't want to carry on beyond the point it's good. Also, but I think we, we start, when we started writing shows, we, did, we were influenced a lot by like Seinfeld, we used to talk about a lot, and um, yeah. Simpsons. And we did feel like we could have done with more episodes of The Office and Faulty Towers, and that there were a lot of British shows that didn't necessarily need to end. Not, not the, the, the creators of those shows obviously were totally right to do it when they felt, but that we wouldn't 
we wouldn't necessarily feel like it was a mark of uh, quality to stop that you if you if you if you've still got ideas and the lead characters still want to do it then it's nice to carry on what's the most fruitful mistake you've made what's the what's the kind of thing that's gone wrong that has taught you the most there's an episode of peep show that we always when we think things are going wrong we always go back to probably unfairly but we demonize it now called the man show it wasn't that, was that what it was called on tv when it went out it was yeah. in episode series 1 two. or 2 uh, anyway it was one where we had a all these great scenes, we thought, and all these great set pieces, and the final episode was just one of those ones where I think the viewers kind of felt a bit ho-hum at the end, and certainly I think we did. And I think the, the lesson that we always try and reteach ourselves when we think about it is you can have all these great set pieces, but if you lose that sort of sense of what's going on and what the story is, the audience just drifts a bit, and, it, uh, and the, the set pieces need to be so amazing that... Uh, it's an uh, unachievable feat, whereas if you have a story that you care about, people will stick with you through the scene, which is not the killer scene, to get to hopefully the one which is. Sam, just have one last thing. You were saying before that you, now that you're at Series 8, you've forgotten some of the jokes from Series 1, and yeah. when you're looking at that stuff, you've, you know, you've forgotten that you wrote it. Uh, when you see it again, do you always know what you've written individually? Do you always know the title on a joke, or do you...? Do you... So that's a good question. I mean, Sometimes, but not always. Occasionally, I might remember oh, I wrote that line or Jesse wrote that line. But one of the nice things about a collaboration is that there is a kind of cabinet responsibility, and often you do forget, and it and it all kind of gets munged up, and that's a really nice thing because it doesn't feel like, you know, that's my bit. You can't change that bit. It doesn't feel like that. We always have shared ownership, and I think that's a really good. Anyone who's in a writing partnership, which I'd recommend if you're doing comedy, I think that's a great way to approach it because if you start. You know, marking your territory, you're in probably a bit of a trouble, I'd say. I can't go on any longer. My bladder, I'm busting. Well, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do, is there? Let me piss in that prayer bucket. Prayer bucket? There's no such thing as... That's just a bucket. OK, I'm going to creep up to the bucket. No, 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 you can't move. What am I going to do then? I can't hold on. If you really can't hold it in, then you'll just have to piss yourself. You're telling me to piss myself? Yes, if you've got to go, piss yourself. Is this what it's come to? Yes, and do it quietly. Great. And what shall I do after I've pissed myself? Fuck myself? Eat myself? You're such a... Are you doing it already? Yes, I'm doing it already. I'm so pathetic that as soon as you ordered me to piss myself, I started the procedure. This is what you've done. You've ground down my sense of self-worth over the years. I hope you're proud. When are you going to stop? Not for a bit. Stop, Jeremy. S stop it. It's, it's going down the cracks. I can't stop. Stop! Oh, piss yourself. Stop pissing yourself. It's not that simple. The floodgates are open. I'm ordering you to stop. You're a big real dick about this, aren't you? <laughs> oh, shit, shit. Oh, my God. This has got to be a dream. Nothing this bad could ever happen in reality. What am I going to do? Throw myself off? Surprise. Uh, hello, it, it's, it's me. Look, I, I've surprised you. What, what, a, what a brilliant joke. <laughs>